please. The Honorable Minister of Finance. There is a line um, from a Shakespeare play, and I think it might be Macbeth, but I might be mistaken, where one of the characters says, methinks she doth protest too much. I think this is the second protestation that the member has given. It was kind of awkward for him at the committee when in his closing statement, in response to no accusation from anywhere at all. He started denying that the NDP had any hand in orchestrating or engineering to bring people out. And he was giving these uh, successive statements to say, we in no way, shape, or form talk to any of these people. I've never seen these people in my life. I, I don't know what he was raising these concerns for. No one had made allegations of him. And it seemed to me that he was protesting too much, and we hear him protesting the same now. W were there similarities in script in a lot of the presentations? Yeah, but that reflects in no way on the right of people to come and give those scripts and read from those scripts if they choose to do so. Some people spoke ex extemporaneously, and that is their, that is their right and, and uh, an ability to do so. Some people read from scripts, and that's their right. And if those scripts uh, you know, uh, aligned very closely with the scripts of others, that's, that's all right as well, because that's their right to come to committee. And I'll defend their right all day long to come to committee. Uh, the member seems to be advancing a narrative that somehow the government just won't listen. The government just won't listen. I want to show him three specific ways in which the government specifically addressed concerns of the Manitoba Industrial Power Users Group as it has advanced this bill. And I thought it was interesting that Mr. Friesen, not referring to myself, but the representative from MyPug, as it's called, didn't reference any of those. And yet the members of MyPug specifically cited and thanked me in a meeting this summer for addressing concerns and being responsive to hear their concerns. The first area, this member will know it that in a previous iteration, that had uh, accommodated some of these concerns about hydro and about rates, rates in the future and the need to protect those low rates. There were four targets set for debt equity. This bill waived that requirement for four targets and replaced them with two targets, two stage gates to achieve a better debt equity ratio in response to concerns raised in part by MyPug. This bill contains, in contrast to a previous bill that addressed similar concerns, a three-year rate period. So one rate application 
could suffice for three years. A previous bill contained a five-year rate application. This change was made in response, in part, to representations from my party. And this bill, in contrast to a previous bill similar to it in some ways, eliminated the setting of hydro rates in an interim way by cabinet, simply because in the interim period, there would have been no one to set the rate. We eliminated that by requiring hydro to go back to the PUB and confirm their interim rate and to do so, to bring a general rate increase application for the next two years until the enactment period described in this bill, which is 2025. I've just cited for the member three ways in which the government, through this legislation, has directly heard from and responded to individuals and groups who made applications to the government about this bill. But let me end by saying this. If the member wants to have a conversation about who we believe the better party is to be able to facilitate economic growth, provide the conditions that give confidence to business and industry and individuals in their own households, we will put our record against them any day and every day and all day long because this is the former government who stubbornly refused to even index the tax brackets, who held their foot on the neck of the poor by not increasing the basic personal amount, and who increased the payroll tax and a series of other taxes and culminated it into raising the PST. This member has nothing to say in lecturing us on the deck. Honorable Minister, his time is up. The member for St. James. Thank you. Um, the minister is speaking about um, you know, this, this idea that his government is inspiring or inspires confidence and in industry and business in this province, and yet I just finished reading a quote to him from a representative of some of the largest businesses in this province, some of the biggest job creators in this province, that the bill he's advancing and supporting, along with every single member of the PC caucus, is going to destroy jobs and economic activity in Manitoba. He can congratulate himself on making a terrible bill slightly less terrible, as he just did, but that doesn't change things at all. The reality is, is he heard from a wide range of people and specifically from representatives of some of the largest businesses in this province that this bill will destroy jobs and will destroy economic activity. I'll ask him again, can he reflect on the comments by my pug's representative that this bill will destroy jobs and econ economic activity in Manitoba. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Yeah. I welcome a conversation uh, with this member about what we believe the real threat to jobs and growth in Manitoba would be. And I would submit to that member that the real threat to jobs and growth would be a government who does not effectively participate with and interact with industry and business leadership and groups, with chambers of commerce, with business advocacy groups like the CFIB and others, in order to continue to create the conditions in a province that foster and lead to economic growth. The NDP, did not even do the basics. They did not even index their tax brackets. That meant that even the lowest income earners paid tax in this province thousands of dollars previous to what they would in places like Alberta or Saskatchewan. As a matter of fact, when we took government, the disparity between Manitoba's basic personal amount and Saskatchewan's was six thousand dollars that's a tax on the poor that's a tax on the poor but the payroll tax the health and post-secondary uh, tax that was a tax on all businesses it was a tax that directly discouraged growth 
Because when a business got to a certain threshold, they got a surprise in the mail, and it wasn't a letter of congratulations by an NDP finance minister to say thank you for creating jobs. It was a tax, taxed on growth, taxed on new hires, taxed on payrolls. That is why budget 2022 has made progress by raising those thresholds, pulling hundreds of job creators off those lists who no longer pay the payroll tax or pay it to a far lesser extent. The provincial sales tax was raised by the previous government, first widened, which in that year took in $155 million more in one year in 2014, and every year thereafter compounded as the price of goods and the effect of nominal GDP was factored in. But beyond that, the tax was raised by 14%, an increase from 7 to 8% PST, it's not a 1% increase, it's a 14% increase resulting in a billion dollars of additional revenue to the NDP, and still they could not make pro uh, progress against their deficit targets. No wonder bond rating agencies and investors said about Manitoba, the NDP don't have a revenue problem, they have a spending problem. So the member wants to lecture today on what he believes are the conditions that create growth. I would say the greatest threat to a province in its future are a government that finds itself unable or unwilling to create the conditions that foster growth, that help hardworking families keep more of their income, to have greater after-tax income, to allow them to make decisions about how they will raise children and how they will invest their money and pay down their debts and get ahead in society and care and make contributions uh, in a charitable way. Um, the NDP represented the greatest threat to the future of Manitobans, as they do in respect of Bill 36, because they tripled the debt of Manitoba Hydro in the space of six years, a debt that stands at $24 billion. I met with a chief economist yesterday after our proceedings, and I asked that chief economist, one of Manitoba's leaders, or Canada's leaders, does debt matter? I said, because the critic for the NDP said it doesn't matter. The chief economist, for one of the biggest banks in Canada said, I assure you that debt matters very much. And especially in the context when interest rates are rising and the cost of carrying debt becomes more expensive as it is now. Hydro's carrying cost for debt service is now $1.1 billion. The member says, who cares? Hydro's debt is $24 billion. He says, who cares? We know this will result in higher rates if left unchecked, and he says, who cares? We don't take that point of view. It's why we stand on the side of Manitobans protecting low rates, giving the PUB a broader mandate, and helping Hydro to stabilize more uh, in future with reasonable debt to equity targets over time. The member for St. James. Thank you. The, uh, the minister can continue to misrepresent uh, our position on hydro debt as much as he'd like. Uh, but he knows that uh, we, on this side of the House, uh, the opposition support uh, what the Public Utilities Board found and their needs for an alternative to hearing. They very clearly identified that hydro could sustain those investments and outlined, um, outlined exactly what would be required to help ensure that those debts were paid down. We believe in the Public Utilities Board. We believe in their role. We believe that they have done an excellent job in ensuring that Manitobans pay as little as possible for their electricity and their utilities. We do not believe in destroying the Public Utilities Board and disempowering them as this government seeks to do. So the Minister again can continue to misrepresent as much as he'd like, but he's not fooling anybody. I'd like to ask him to provide uh, some comment on uh, something that was said by Mr. Friesen of the uh, of MIPUG. He stated that the financial targets identified in the bill will result in a more than a doubling of hydro rates by 2040, and that it will require hydro to raise $7.5 billion in new revenue. Can you provide comment on that?
The Honorable Minister of Finance. I'd be pleased to offer a response to the member, but just before I do so, he did in his previous uh, question cite uh, his concern about economic development in Manitoba. I refer him to page 52 of the budget and budget documents, which shows the kind of large and medium scale projects that are completed underway or announced right now in Manitoba. This includes Valley announcing a $150 million investment to extend mining activities in Thompson by 10 years. Center Venture and University of Manitoba Community Renewal Corp undertaking the development of 2.4 acres of market land site just west of City Hall, building a $40 million 10-story housing development. Maple Leaf Foods, $182 million, 73,000 square foot. That's like two Costco's stuck together. Expansion of his Lajimodia Boulevard facility in Winnipeg. Neo Financial Technologies, a second headquarters in the Exchange District, 300 new jobs. Sio Silica Corporation, that was formerly Can White, uh, White Sands Corp, uh, issued an environmental licensing to establish an operation in the arm of Springfield. HUD Bay Minerals announcing plans to significantly increase operations in Snow Lake. Parrish and Heimbecker, a $50 million grain handling facility now open outside Dougal. Um, Charbon Corp. Bell MTS, a $400 million investment in fiber optic infrastructure in Winnipeg and outside of Winnipeg. Merit Functional Foods, a $150 million, 100,000 square foot canola based protein production, production center. High Life, broadening its vertical integration of its hog processing. Simplot, doubling processing capacity. Roquette, construction of the world's largest pea production facility uh, right outside, right in, in Port of the Prairie. McCain Foods in Port of the Prairie and upgrading its potato processing plants in Carberry and Portage. Maple Leaf Foods capacity expansion. Canada Goose Holdings, a new factory. Ubisoft opening a new Winnipeg studio. Mr. Chair, I assure the member for St. James that the economic future of Manitoba looks exceedingly bright. Last night, I had the opportunity to attend uh, a function that was attended by uh, key business leaders in the city of Winnipeg and across the province of Manitoba. I assure that member not one of them cited a concern that linked Bill 36 and its provisions to any sudden demise. And I would say those are the real experts who know economic development, business, investment, risk management. And I would put their collective reputations, 200 of them, before the opinion of an associate from IPUG. He's welcome to his opinion. I respectfully disagree. I respectfully disagree. So when the, when the member says, what do you think of his opinion? He's welcome to his opinion. I disagree. So that would be my answer for him. However, to his question about the threat of increasing hydro rates, has the member studied the NDP hydro rate increases from 2004 to 2015? I wonder if that member has actually looked at the request and the PUB approval. Because in 2004, the PUB approved a 5% increase from Manitoba Hydro. In 2005, a 2.25% increase. In 2007, a 2.25% increase. In 2008, a 5% increase. In 2009, a 2.8% increase. In 2010, a 2.8% increase. In 2011, a 2% increase. In 2012, I believe two increases, 4.4%, and there might have been another, in 2013, a 3.5% increase. In 2014, a 2.75% increase. And in 2015, a 3.95% increase. The cumulative increase is 56%, but that is not compounded. That member knows the principle of compounding. So I'll be happy to bring back to this table what these numbers actually look out. It looks to me, on the basis of this, that this is a doubling of rates by the NDP. But at a time when inflation was at, at points at a record low, certainly uh, multiples lower than now. So here's the record. The NDP doubled hydro rates. And there's one more thing to add to the record. If the provisions of Bill 36 holding down annual rate increases had been in effect, those rate increases by the NDP would have been $1.2 billion less. The member for St. James. Interesting language from the minister. 
appreciate uh, the response there. Um, I'd like to just ask sort of one more question reflecting on committee um, and give him an opportunity to, you know, to, to confirm that he is actually listening uh, when Manitobans uh, come forward with their concerns. We had, again, dozens and dozens of people representing a broad range, a diverse uh, range of Manitobans, um, environmentalists, representative of big industry, a um, huge coalition of, of Manitobans who are against the bill. So I want to ask him, does what he learned at committee, does it in any way uh, encourage him or does it give him pause to think that this bill should be scrapped? Does the minister, after having heard dozens and dozens of Manitobans speak about their concerns with the bill, does the minister in any way feel differently about the bill, feel differently about its contents? Does he believe that he should consider recommending that this bill be scrapped? The Honorable Minister of Finance. So the uh, member's allegation is the government doesn't listen. Uh, but in a previous question he asked, I was able to uh, respond to his question and indicate uh, and give him simply three examples of how Bill 36 has actually incorporated the advice and interactions and consultation that we've done with various groups, including my pug, which he referenced. I gave him three examples of how this bill is actually different from predecessor bills based on the advice that we heard. The member also does not cite the fact that those previous bills uh, were heard by committee. No. Uh, the previous bills were debated, and there was opportunity even during debate because the public knew about the uh, bills and had input. People wrote to the minister's office. Uh, the minister conducted consultations on the bill. The minister would have held a bill briefing with the members of the opposition who would have cited concerns and raised questions and asked civil servants, some of whom will be around this table today, about the bill. But if the member is trying to advance a narrative that this government just doesn't listen, I refer him to page 25 of the budget, which makes clear that the budget for 2022 was informed by more than 51 thousand Manitobans participating in budget consultation processes, even more than in the previous year. Uh, many of these by uh, my predecessor on this role, as he held this role before me. I believe I could say his name now because he's no longer a member of uh, the legislature. So Mr. Scott Fielding, who was, uh, the, uh, member, uh, was the Minister of Finance, who uh, attended those meetings. There were 74 100 responses received on an online survey, 10,300 people participated in quick polls, engagements and consultations occurred through telephone town halls, virtual meetings, online surveys, and through email and written submissions. It shows you that this government was listening. I could cite examples for the member of points in the past where the government has actually 
listened as well. When we took uh, government and realized that there was too much money being spent not on the creation of public schools, but we felt that there could be more schools built if we could somehow harness savings in the construction process. And indeed, the member for Portage La Prairie led that work when he was the Minister of Education in 2016 and 2017. And it was that minister and that work that went out and said, well, the previous NDP government had uh, an ideological uh, aversion to alternative service delivery. So we investigated it. And even now, the member for St. James mutters at the table, or for Gary, mutters at the table. That's all about privatization. But in fact, what it was about was trying to build more schools because the, the Minister of Education at the time, his observation was that the NDP didn't build enough schools. And they could have done more if they would have harnessed better savings, efficiencies, uh, uh, changed their procurement practices. And indeed, the member who is now the Minister for Labor, Consumer Protection, and Government Services has done a lot of that heavy lifting when it comes to modernizing procurement rules. But the fact is the government said, we believe we're going to go a P3 route. Well, I'll tell you, I think the NDP did not know what to do with themselves when we gave an update six months later and said, we investigated it, we looked at it, we turned it around and said, we believe we can get the same efficiencies out of the conventional process. We didn't advance it. And I think they were scratching their heads and scratching their heads, and they didn't know what to message in the media because we acted on the basis of evidence. Likewise, these members saw a bill based on education reform, and we believe it's important to continue to modernize education. But we didn't advance because we listened to Manitobans. So the member's in a tough spot, trying to at once advance a narrative that this government never uh, listens, listens to no one, and just charges ahead with blinders on, come what may, damn the torpedoes, you know, whatever happens. But the fact of the matter is I've given him in these proceedings specific examples of how we have listened in budget 2022, when it's come to policies in the past, and in, in, including, um, as I said, the 50,000 people plus who were consulted in the process that led to budget 2022. So we'll continue to listen, uh, and we'll continue to respond to Manitobans. And uh, we're still committed to the goals of keeping hydro rates low, stabilizing hydro, and providing for broader powers to the PUB to avoid uh, debacles like the NDP caused in the past. A member for St. James. Thank you very much. So it sounds like the minister is listening to everyone except for the 50 or so people that just showed up to tell him to scrap the bill. Um, I'd like to. Uh, I'd like to move on to ask the minister uh, about rate uh, increases in the future, what we might expect. We have not had a general rate hearing in Manitoba for some time. Um, and I'm wondering if the minister uh, and his government are intending on legislating another hydro rate increase on Manitobans as they did in 2021, the 2.9% uh, rate increase that was imposed on Manitobans in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of an affordability crisis. Um, is his government planning on um, legislating another hydro rate increase in the near future? Uh, or do they intend on uh, holding uh, a general rate hearing uh, to determine any uh, future rate increases?
the Honorable Minister of Finance. So, Mr. Chair, I see the trap that the member is trying very inelegantly to lay for me, and I will uh, endeavor not to step into that trap that has not even been covered with leaves. He's still got the sticks sharpened and pointed and, and sticking up from the bottom of the trap, but <laughs> but uh, he hasn't uh, he hasn't set that snare very well. The member knows full well that the government has no role in this bill to set rates for Manitoba Hydro. The, the government has a role uh, in that Hydro, as a crown corporation, is owned by the province of Manitoba. We like to say it's owned by the people of Manitoba. It is responsive to the ratepayers. Manitoba Hydro answers to its board of directors and its chair of the board. It's led executively by its CEO and executive officers. Uh, but, I, uh, so uh, uh, let's just say categorically, no is the answer to the member's question because in this governance structure, it is the regulator who sets rates for Manitoba Hydro. What the member is referring to is a one-time occurrence in 2020 when through the Budget Implementation and Tax Statutes Act, Act there was that interim mechanism. The previous bill described this beginning of a new era where hydro would bring a better application based on an integrated resource plan. And this is actually referred to on page seven of the annual report of Manitoba Hydro where it indicates, and it says here, we, I'm quoting, we started development of Manitoba Hydro's first ever integrated resource plan, IRP, a foundational empirical document that will guide the actions we take and investments we will make to meet the energy needs of our customers for the future. And our IRP includes input from thousands of customers and interested parties across Manitoba, as well as through data and research on our available and future energy resources and the different things that could affect them. When complete, our IRP will ensure the plans we make and act on are reflective not only of the input we gain from customers and other stakeholders, but also understood and firmly rooted in a practical reality today and in the years to come, Manitoba Hydro's vision for the future involves partnership and guidance in keeping with trends across the industry, across the world, we have begun to put the pieces in place toward building a new kind of relationship with customers. One of a trusted energy advisor helping customers understand the changing energy landscape and the new options and choices it could represent. We are building on the history by consulting with customers. Our collaboration with Efficiency Manitoba continues. We're working hand in hand with the province too as they develop a provincial energy policy framework. Our integrated resource plan is pivotal on this front. Comprehensive, thorough, far-reaching basis of knowledge and expertise. So the member seems to imply that this is easy peasy and should have been done yesterday. But I assure the member, this was never done in the past. An IRP represents a significant jumping off point where a far broader, broader array of evidence and opinion is used to determine rates based on the state of capital and infrastructure based on cur current world financial uh, situations, based on representations from individuals and consumer groups and industry and others who present at those hearings. What the previous bill did was said, there needs to be a couple of work for this, uh, we, uh, years for this work to be completed. And that decision was made in conjunction with Hydro and the PUB and others. It was meant to simply provide that ability for them to get there. However, we found a better way through Bill 36 that involves absolutely no interim rate setting by the government of Manitoba. Let me be clear. The PUB sets rates. The Crown Corporation Manitoba Hydro brings a rate application. In November, they will be back at the PUB to uh, present evidence to confirm their interim rate application. And for the next two years, previous to the trigger date stated in this bill, uh, they will continue to bring rate applications. There is no role, there is no function, the government does not set the rates 
for Manitoba Hydro, and I hope the member has it clear. The member for St. James. It is very painfully clear that the minister was not listening to the presenters that came before committee who repeatedly stated to him in no uncertain terms that the bill will turn the Public Utilities Board into a rubber stamp. Those are words that I think multiple committee, committee presenters used. And the reason is, is because the bill creates aggressive financial targets, which will force hydro to raise, well, according to the Manitoba Industrial Power Users Group, $7.5 billion that will force aggressive rate hikes year after year after year. The minister's own bill, the minister's his own piece of legislation states these financial targets. I would hope that he would have more clarity on what they entail and the impacts of those targets, but apparently not. I'd like to ask him about the energy policy that um, his government has contracted. There is a long-term energy policy framework being developed right now in coordination or collaboration with Dunsky Energy and Climate Advisors. Um, many stakeholders have been engaged. Obviously, this will have long-term implications for hydro and for energy in Manitoba. And yet, uh, while this transformational policy is being developed, the government is seeking to ram forward a piece of legislation that will fundamentally alter the way that the Public Utilities Board operates and will fundamentally drive higher and higher rates. Can the minister provide comment on the wisdom of advancing Bill 36 and passing this bill prior to his government learning about what the Dunsky energy policy framework has to say about the future of energy and hydro in this province. The Honourable Minister of Finance. We found a very helpful chart that was actually cr uh, created and prepared by the Public Utilities Board. And the member may want to avail himself of this chart. I'd be happy to provide a copy to himself and his analyst as well. And what it shows is not just the information that I read into the record about annual increases under the NDP for hydro, 
And not only the information I read in about the fact that those, uh, that those uh, rate increases were significant, some of them 5%, but there's more information on here. There's information that indicates that sometimes the PUB approved hydro rates even more than Manitoba Hydro requested. In 2004, under the NDP, I wonder if the member knew that Manitoba Hydro requested a rate of 3%. The PUB approved five. In 2008, Hydro requested a 2.9% increase. The PUB approved 5%. And you can see across these charts, it actually talks about the difference rate between application and approval. Even gives the board order so he can look them up. But it also indicates the CPI that was going on at the time. In those years I just cited, CPI was less than one third of what it is today. If left unprotected right now on the current landscape, and this is the issue that the member for St. James refuses to address at all costs, in this environment of seven and 8% CPI, rate payers for Manitoba Hydro are exposed. That member knows that the mandate of the PUB is to balance the interests of the Crown Corporation and fair and reasonable rates. But in an environment of CPI increases, inflation, Bank of Canada increases, these protections are necessary. This bill holds down any annual award of the PUB, it protects ratepayers, because I've clearly showed that when CPI in 2004 was 2%, if hydro could be awarded a 5% increase in a 2% environment, it means that 15% could have been possible in a 6% CPI if hydro were applying now for a rate, but for the provisions of this bill that would not let such an award happen. It creates parameters. It is the guardrails on the sides of the bowling alley at the five pin. The ball still rolls towards the pins, but it can't go to the gutter. It protects rate payers. So when the member says, why bring it now? Because protections for rate payers are urgent now. However, Moody's warned. The members never mentioned this. He says there's nothing to fear. Debt has no consequences, he says. Debt service rate of $1.1 billion at Hydro has no consequence. He said all things are on a guide, glide path to peace and stability. But Moody said that Hydro continues to constitute the province's single largest contingent liability at this time. So I, I think the member is saying he wants to get on the horn and phone Moody's and DBRS and Standard Poor's and say, you guys have it all wrong. You, you highly paid analysts and managers of Manitoba's account, you simply don't understand. There's nothing to see here. Debt has no consequences, interest rates have no consequences, and carrying costs for debt have no consequences. And yet, chief economists, bond rating agencies, and investors say otherwise. So it's no wonder that this member says, oh, just kick down the road any provisions to stabilize hydro and protect ratepayers. We say no. We say concurrent, not consecutive, because it happens right now. The IRP is very, very important. That work is underway. Environmental policy is underway. And Bill 36 to, present, to protect Manitobans, to protect low rates, which would be much higher were it not for the protection of this bill, arguably. Um, so I invite the member uh, to comment on this evidence I've presented at the table. The member for St. James. Yeah, we, we strongly disagree that the right response to concerns expressed by bond rating agencies is to kneecap the Public Utilities Board. That's not the right, uh, not the right approach. Um, I, I just, uh, I'd like to ask the minister uh, about some comments he's made in the past 
Um, one of the main arguments that this government has advanced about the need for this bill, well, we haven't heard them talk a lot about this lately, um, is their concerns about uh, value for money from the uh, Public Utilities Board hearings. Um, of course, uh, throughout the course of committee presentations, we heard uh, many people um, state that um, hydro hearings cost a typical residential customer $2.50 a year. And those numbers, I believe, came from the Public Interest Law Center. Uh, and the Public Interest Law Center also um, calculated that the same customers save $50 per year on their hydro bill annually as a result of the pub hearing. So um, it's clear that the Public Utilities Board does create uh, fantastic value for Manitobans in helping to keep our rates low, and, and they do that for an incredibly small uh, amount of money on each of our, uh, our overall bills on a yearly basis. Um, the minister in the past claimed, and I'm going to quote him right now, it's, he said uh, to the Canadian press March 23rd, 2022, it's not in our interest on an annual basis to have a hearing that costs $10 million. Um, documents filed by Manitoba Hydro with the pub in July showed that the average cost of hydro rate hearings was less than $5 million annually. So I just want to invite the minister to comment on what happened there. Did he misspeak or was he intentionally introducing misinformation onto the record? So if he could provide some clarity on why he was claiming that costs for the pub were $10 million a year, when in fact the evidence suggested that it was much, much less than that. Will he clarify whether or not he misspoke or did he intentionally introduce misinformation on the record? The Honourable Minister of Finance. It's quite something to hear the member for St. James make an allegation at this table about deliberately misleading and Bill 36. And I think this would provide an excellent opportunity for the member to do some introspection. Because if anyone's behaviors should be called in question in respect to statements made pertaining to Bill 36, it is that member for, for St. James, who has knowingly gone into the legislature day after day and knowingly gone to the press and has said that this bill requires annual increases 
of 5% a year. He called it a requirement for 5%, knowing full well as he does that the bill makes clear that increases are held to CPI increases or 5%, whichever is less. For the member to knowingly repeat those statements day after day, to tweet them out and put them on social media, to send those responses to his constituents, to say them to the press, is disappointing and is troubling. I've said to him in these proceedings, it is one thing for he and I to disagree on policy or approach. I think we essentially, at the end of the day, want the same thing in Manitoba. We want the low rates for hydro to continue because it's a competitive advantage and we need it. We want economic development. And neither of us wants to see hydro fail. But it's quite challenging for me to hear the member make an allegation at this table. If the member wants to talk about deliberately misleading Manitobans and Bill 36 in the same sentence, I would be very, very happy to have that conversation. So I invite him to do some introspection, to do some soul searching, and to ask himself if he feels good about his behavior and his conduct in respect of misleading Manitobans on Bill 36. I don't think he should feel that good about that. Quoting from Manitoba Hydro's website, there's a cost breakdown based on recent regulatory filings. On Manitoba Hydro's website, which I would gladly provide the link for the member for, it's www.hydro.mb.ca forward slash regulatory underscore affairs. And it says how the costs break down. Manitoba Hydro regulatory costs in millions of dollars. Intervenor costs, $1 million. PUB advisor costs, $3.1 million. Other PUB regulatory matters, $500,000. PUB administration fees, $700,000. Internal Manitoba Hydro staff, regular and overtime, $4.1 million. Other costs, $600,000. Get your pencil ready, $10.1 million dollars total actual average regulatory costs. The member wants to go buy a Ford F-150, but he only wants to pay for the front half of the pickup truck. The problem is if you go and buy the F-150, you have to buy the whole truck. And describing the cost as only half the truck is disingenuous. He's referring to, um, he's referring to hearing costs that pertain solely and explicitly to PUB regulatory amounts. But those amounts do not also accommodate all the other categories of expense. It is not free to do a regulatory hearing. And those are the true costs. So let him dispute it. Let him go to the website. I asked the CEO of Hydro if she stood by her statements of those costs. And she did without equivocation. I remind that member, the CEO for Hydro has years of experience on this job and formerly at BC Hydro. And uh, I would say knows what she is talking about. The member for St. James. Um, no more questions for the minister. Is there any further questions? OK. Uh, seeing no further questions, we will now move on to consideration of resolutions of the bill, or, or the estimates. Resolution 7.2, resolved that be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $1,078,000 for finance, crown services for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2023. Shall the resolution pass? pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 7.3. Resolved that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding 
$129,000 for finance, fiscal policy, and corporate services for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2023. Shall the resolution pass? Pass. The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 7.4. Resolve that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $6,455,000 for finance, communications, and engagement for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2023. Shall the resolution pass? Pass. The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 7.5. Resolve that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $2,460,000 for finance, Treasury for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2023. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 7.6. Resolve that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $16,000,000 $475,000 for finance, compliance and enforcement for the fifth. Resolution 7.6. Resolve that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $16,465,000 for finance, Compliance and enforcement for the fiscal year ended March 31st, 2023. Shall the resolution pass? pass. The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 7.7, .7, resolve that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $10,100,000 for finance, Treasury Board Secretariat for the fiscal year ended March 31st, 2023. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 7.8, resolve that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $2,300,000 for finance, policy and planning secretariat for the fiscal year ended March 31st, 2023. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 7.9, resolve that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $2,522,000 for finance, intergovernmental affairs for the fiscal year ended March 31st, 2023. Shall the resolution pass? pass. The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 7.1, oh, resolve that there be 7.10. Resolved that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $125,000 for finance capital assets for the fiscal year ended March 31st, 2023. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 7.11. Resolved that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $906,000 $597,000 for finance, other reporting entities, capital investment for the fiscal year ended March 31st, 2023. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. The last item to be considered for the estimates of this department is 7.1 bracket A, the minister, minister's salaries contained in resolution 7.1. At this point, we request the minister's staff leave the table for the consideration of this last item. Okay, the floor is open for questions. Seeing none, we'll move on to resolution 7.1. Resolve that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $8,507,000 for finance, administration and finance for 
fiscal year ended March 31st, 2023. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. This completes the estimates of the Department of Finance. The next set of estimates to be considered for, by this section of the Committee of Supply is for tax credits. Is it the will uh, that we should break uh, recess to allow the minister and the critics the opportunity to prepare for the commencement of the next set of estimates? Agreed. Agreed. And so order. The committee will now recess.
Will the committee supply please come to order? This section of the committee supply will now consider the estimates of tax credits. Does the Honorable Minister have an opening statement? The Honorable Minister of Finance. No. Thank you. Thank you. Does the critic for the official opposition have an opening statement? We thank the member for those comments. At this time, we invite the minister staff to join us at the table and we. Call the resolutions. Can I just ask for these? Mr. Chair. According to our rule 77 bracket 16, during the consideration of departmental estimates, questioning for each department shall proceed in a global manner with questions put separately on all resolutions once the official opposition critic indicates that the questions has concluded. The floor is now open for questions. And there is no questions. We'll now proceed to the resolution. Resolution 33.1 resolved that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $515,571,000 for tax credits, tax rebates, and fees for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2023. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. This concludes the Department of Tax Credits. This section of the committee supply will now consider the estimates of emergency expenditures. Does the Honorable Minister have an opening statement? The Honorable Minister? No. I thank the minister for those comments and does the critic from the official opposition have an opening statement? No. Thank you uh, for those comments. The floor is now open for questions. Seeing none, we'll move on to resolution 27.1. Resolved that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $100 million for emergency expenditures, emergency expenditures for the fiscal year ended March 31st, 2023. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. This concludes the Department of Emergency Expenditures. This section of the committee supply will now consider the estimates of enabling appropriations. Does the Honourable Minister have an opening statement? The Honourable Minister? No. I thank the Minister for those comments and does the official opposition critic have an opening statement? I thank the member for those comments. The floor is now open for questions. Seeing no questions, we'll move on to resolution 26.1. Resolved that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $1,250,000 for enabling appropriations, enabling vote for the fiscal year ended March 31st, 2023. Shall the resolution pass? The res resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 26.2, resolved that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $869,656,000 for enabling appropriations, internal service adjustments for the fiscal year ended March 31st, 2023. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 26.3, resolved that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $40 million for enabling appropriations, green and carbon reduction fund for the fiscal year ended March 31st, 2023. Shall the resolution pass? 
The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 26.4, resolved that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $256,401,000 for enabling appropriations capital assets, internal service adjustments for the fiscal year ended March 31st, 2023. Shall that resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. This completes the estimates of enabling appropriation. The next set of estimates to be considered by this section of the Committee of Supply is for the Department of Families. Is it the will of the committee to briefly recess to allow the ministers and the critics the opportunity to prepare? Agreed. We will not, the committee recess.
Will the committee supply please come to order? This section of the committee supply will now resume consideration of the estimates for the Department of Families. A question, questioning for this department will proceed in a global manner and the floor is now open for questions. The member for Union Station. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So yesterday, I, I had just asked the minister a question in regards to Lions Place. I know the minister um, stated that she does have a meeting subsequent to their meeting last week with Lions Place, I believe scheduled for today, um, resuming later on uh, this evening. But my question yesterday was specifically regarding Lions Place remaining social housing. So my concern, and I can appreciate that the minister is uh, meeting the residents and that their committee where they're at and wanting to hear them and meet with them and work with them to find a, a solution which best fits their needs. Um, this property is for sale and my concern is that um, is the, the absence of a commitment to ensure that whatever the outcome might be that these residents, uh, again, most of which are seniors, low income seniors, um, do have the opportunity to remain in their homes and for their rents to remain social, um, social rents, so socially affordable housing. So I'm wondering if the minister um, can, can articulate for us whether or not she is committed to ensuring that it remains social housing for those residents who are predominantly seniors at Lions Place.
the Honourable Minister of Families. Well, I thank the member for the question, and I thank her for her advocacy on this very important issue. I apologize. Can I retract and restart over? I thank the member for their the, question. The Honourable Minister of Families. I thank the member for their question and really appreciate their advocacy on this issue. And um, uh, we share a commitment to the creation of social and affordable housing in the province of Manitoba and ensuring that all Manitobans have a safe and affordable place to call home. Our government has demonstrated this commitment by working with several partners on the creation of affordable and social housing, including um, partners in the federal government. We've, that's why we signed on to the National Housing Strategy. Um, we've been working with the city, other nonprofit housing providers, and um, looking at many different tools to ensure uh, there are housing options for people in the province, including rent supplements, rent assist, and other, other um, tools to uh, keep people in their homes and help people find safe and affordable housing. In, in uh, relation to this specific project, uh, we are working with the group um, and we had a very productive meeting today. All the requests that have come so far from the group uh, have been met and we will continue to engage with them. Currently what they're wanting to do is establish and, and form a working group which would have um, federal governments represented at the table. Uh, city at the table and other nonprofit housing providers as well as the province and I have assured the group that I will um, the province will be at the table and we are excited to um, explore options but let's be clear they are the leaders they're taking the lead on where uh, what the next steps are and we are um, certainly uh, engaged and and wanting to work with them, but they are taking the lead and they've asked us to sit at the table of the working group to discuss a myriad options and that's exactly what we're doing. The member for Union Station. I thank the minister for her response and I, I do think it is a, a good sign and a positive step from the minister and her department that they are engaging um, so quickly with Lions Place. I know the request was made not long ago and uh, I'll be blunt and say that, you know, there are times where as the MLA, I'll reach out to uh, different departments or ministers rather, more specifically on particular issues. And I appreciate um, that the minister is addressing this expeditiously. I, I am concerned that the minister is not willing to fully commit to ensure that this remains a social housing building. Um, you know, I, I hear from constituents that live in that building on a regular basis. I have friends in the community who live in that building. There are folks who've lived there for 25 years. There are folks in their 90s who live in that building and are, um, you know, feeling very precariously housed right now. So while I appreciate the minister's engagement with the group and um, the fact that there are many folks coming together to, to work on this, my, my hope is that the minister takes very seriously what's at risk for these residents. Again, predominantly seniors who are, who are vulnerable and um, I'm going to move on from this question as I don't think I'm going to get that particular commitment from the minister, but I, I sincerely hope that we can remain uh, communicative on this issue on the, uh, the best uh, interests of these folks in mind. Uh, I do want to get some clarification around agreements, historical agreements with Lions Place. Previously, the minister had shared with me, I believe in question period, that agreements with Lions Place ended in 2018 Yet the former minister, um, the former minister, had told media at the time that an interim agreement was struck in 2018. Can the minister explain this?
the Honorable Minister of Families. So in 2018, our government entered into a two-year subsequent agreement to provide rent supplements to the social units within the building. Um, the member may know that there are some uh, social units and some are, are affordable units. The social units were the ones that um, had expressed a need for a subsidy. And so we had entered into an agreement to do that for two years. Right now, the rents are still being offered at that social housing rate for the tenants, but without government subsidy because of the good financial health of the landlord currently with um, a fairly excessive surplus. The member for the Paw Camisac. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's my understanding that Manitoba Housing started an assessment report on Manitoba housing properties. My question is, is was this done and what did it find? I go, sir. The Honourable Minister of Families. I apologize, I didn't hear the last part of that question. The member for the Paw Camisac. Thank you. Uh, Manitoba Housing started a housing assessment report on Manitoba, Manitoba housing properties. Is this done and what did it find? The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you very much. And yes, work did commence in September of 2020 with uh, the issuing of a request for proposals, which resulted in um, a successful, two successful proponents. And we anticipate their final report and completion of their work uh, winter 23. The member for Tyndall Park. Chairperson, and with five minutes left, I'm actually going to ask three questions, and the minister and department can do the best to address all three in the response. Uh, the first one is about EIA. Um, a lot of those who are struggling with addictions are struggling in the application process for EIA. What is the minister doing to advocate for those who are struggling with addictions and make this process a little bit easier? Uh, the second question is, how did the province settle on the goal to reduce the child poverty rate by 25% by 2025? Is there evidence to guide this? And what measures have been taken to ensure that we've already made pro uh, positive progress towards this goal? And the last question, uh, the department is seeking to advance reconciliation by increasing the number of department staff who participated in reconciliation training. Can the minister share what is in this training who it is conducted by, and what is the status of reconciliation training in the department uh, at this time?
The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you very much, and I thank the member for that question. Um, in regards to working with people who are struggling to access EIA and are potentially also afflicted with an addiction, we're trying to meet people where they're at and moving EIA. The transformation is all about meeting people where they're at and having a very client-centered approach. Order, the hour being 5 p.m., committee rise.